This tutorial series is brought to you by Polygon. Make better renders faster. Welcome to the last part of level one. So uh, as the final step, we are gonna be adding some materials to our icing and donut, and then doing a final render, at least final for level one, to create just a nice little cute squishy pink donut. So um, with our icing selected, I'm going to the materials panel and I'm gonna add a new material. So, um, we just touched briefly on it before, but uh, this is where you change the properties for a material. And there are a lot of properties. And it can be extremely daunting, I know, as a beginner to like see all this and go like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna, you know. The good news is, is you don't need to know most of this, like especially as a beginner, there's only like two or three things you change a lot. Like even myself, uh, I, I like to think of, oh, here we go, Spider Utility, thank you. Nice reminder again. I, I like to think I know Blender, but I barely ever touch like anisotropic, sheen, clear coat, transmission mode. Like I barely touch most of this. There's really only like two or three you touch a lot. So the first one is base color, which is the base color of a material. That's the easiest way to say it. It's a... Uh, Material can get very sciencey, but it's the albedo uh, side of a material. It's like the underlying. Ah, there's no way to explain it. It's just it's the base color. Okay, it doesn't affect the reflection color. It doesn't affect bump. It doesn't do anything like that. All it is is just like the underlying color of a material. So we're gonna make it look pink or whatever. You know, I'm not here to tell you what your donut should look like. You could give it blue icing. Uh, purple icing, orange icing, yellow icing, it's entirely up to you. But I happen to think that pink uh, icing looks kind of looks kind of nice, looks kind of delicious. So there we go, all right. Now the second um, property that you change a lot for materials is the roughness. The roughness defines how reflective the material looks or how sharp the reflection actually looks. So the lower value you go, like if you go all the way to zero, it's almost like it's a mirror, it's completely sharp. And then as you go higher and higher, you can see that that reflection of the lamp there becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you go all the way to one, it looks almost as if it's made of chalk. Um, and this is how you define how reflective something looks. Some people, especially a lot of beginners, they think that uh, the way to turn off a reflection is to change the specular value. And you can do that, but it's it's overriding the actual like physically accurate properties of the real world because every object in the real world actually has reflection. Sounds crazy, but even a brick, even chalk, everything has reflection. Um, it's just, it's r so rough that you almost can't see it, but it's still there. So I would suggest not touching specular or specular tin or anything like that. I would suggest just leave it, leave it as is. And, uh, and just change the roughness. And if you wanna turn off reflection, just crank it all the way up to one. Anyways, in our case though, we're making this look like icing. It helps to have a reference of icing. So I actually went and bought a donut from the shops and I put it on a plate here and I filmed it for you. So you can see how reflective the icing looks. The more melted it looks, like the fresher out of the oven and freshly glazed, it's gonna look wet, right? So that would be like a low sharp value there. Um, but I find like a value of about like 0 0.3, 0 0.34, something like that. I think looks kind of good. I think it looks fine. Uh, okay, so there's that. And then for most materials, most materials, um, the only other value that you change a lot is like the normal value because that's the bump. So if you're adding like a bumpy sort of surface or something, uh, you would change that. But you have to have something to plug into it when we get to more advanced materials in the following levels, we'll talk about that. But for, for this thing, we don't have any bump. We're just gonna leave it as is. Um, now, because this is icing, icing is actually a kind of a rare type of material in that um, there is another property to it um, and that is called subsurface scattering. So you can see looking at this right now, it, it does look like icing, but something seems off about it. Like it almost looks like it is too hard, right? It looks like it's almost made of concrete. And the reason for that is that looking at our reference of real icing, light isn't just hitting it and bouncing off it. Light's actually entering into it and it's bouncing around. Um, and that is very much similar to human skin. 
so real human skin, um, like the, it has, uh, you can see it especially like on like the corners of people's ears, right? Like with the sun behind them, you see like red, red ears. And that's because it's like almost slightly translucent and light is entering into the skin and it's bouncing around and you get different values. Well, food actually has this property as well. So humans have it, some natural materials and like food basically has this property. So that's this value here, subsurface scattering. So if we increase this, you can see that it starts to, I mean, it looks different, it looks a little weird, but it has that kind of fleshy quality to it. So uh, the one uh, value that you want to change is the color of this. By default, it's set to white. So we could set this to a pinkish reddish color. It, actually, there's very little information online about how to actually use subsurface color. It's a, it's a little, it's kind of like a little out in the open, but my, based on my tests, I find like giving it like a kind of a reddish pink color is good. But then also you've got subsurface radius, which defines how far the light actually bounces around inside the object. Um, and by default, and, and here's the other thing, there's three values, not just one value, but three because there's one for each channel, red value, green value, and blue value, which is weird to me. I don't get it. I'm sure there's a very scientific accurate reason. But anyways, my advice for you because the top one is the red va red value, I would suggest setting that to like a 0.3 and then setting these others to 0.1, the green and the blue. And then that will give it like a reddish, reddish hint, reddish tint to it. And, uh, and it'll go like, it won't go too far as well. You don't want it to look like wax, which is what can happen if you overdo the subsurface value. So actually that does kind of look a little odd to me. 0.25 perhaps. Maybe this is a little bit too something. I don't know. We can tweak these values after. We don't have to be like locked into it right now. But somehow this is looking a little odd to me. Um, I know I went with like 0.3 for my final one. But uh, yeah, this is this. Maybe I'll go 0 0.15, 0 0.15 for these other two values as well. That looks a little bit better. Just a little bit more spread, a little bit more light coming through the donut. You know, you can tweak these all day. 0.3, yeah, there we go, a little bit redder. Nice, okay. Uh, okay, so that's the icing. The icing looks pretty darned good. In the next part, we're gonna put uh, sprinkles on top, but for now, we have some icing, not bad. All right, now, for my, uh, by the way, I've been turning on and off this overlays. Uh, that's just like, you know, the camera, like the outline of selected objects. If I'm working on materials and things like that, I find it helpful to just turn it off so that I can just focus on what I'm doing. But then in order to see what you're selecting, of course, you wanna make sure you have it turned uh, turned on. But anyways, I have my uh, donut selected now. So let's give the donut a material. We are in the uh, future parts. We're gonna give this a proper material, like texture paint it and make it look parts that are like white as well as dark. But just for now, we're gonna give it the simplest material just to make like a really quick uh, quick render. And that's just to make it look a little bit bready, <laughs> a little bit orangey yellow like so. And then the other thing, I'll give it a little bit of subsurf, just a little bit because it is food as well. So bread has light enter into it just a little bit. And I'll just make sure it's yellow. And then let's go 0 0.1, 0.1. Like so. All right. Donut is looking donut-y. So with my camera selected, it's a little far away from my donut. So I'm going to hit G to move my camera. And that'll move it along, you know, like I'm grabbing it. And then I'm going uh, G and then middle mouse button. And then that'll just like, you just push the middle mouse once. And it's like moving it along. It's like forward front facing axis. I don't know, but it's just how you move it forward and back. Uh, what's the what's the term? It's like on a rail in uh, not not pan. Oh, dolly. That's the word I'm thinking of for cameras. It's like dollying it in and out. Anyway, okay, cool. So um, we're gonna do a little render. So obviously for the final. Um, uh, whatever you call it, final, you know, all the way to level four, we're going to put like brick behind it, do a coffee, a plate and all that kind of thing. But just for now, we're just going to make a nice, very simple render for people that want to end it right here. End it all, <laughs> end it like they're going to commit suicide. <laughs> this was the last thing you were going to watch. <laughs> and then that, that inspired you. All right. That's a little dark. Anyway. Um, in this case, what I want to do is I want to have the light just a little bit behind the donut, but this is a case where you can kind of see like 
having like just a single view like this, like looking through my camera, I want to be able to move my light around, but I can't really do it from this view. So let's talk about splitting the view. Uh, to split the view in Blender, you just go up to wherever there's a border and then just right click it. And then you've got an option to vertical split or horizontal split. By the way, I believe this is a 2.81 feature because that's the version I'm using right now. If you're following along with me, you might just have a like join or something like that. Um, like you might have to go to the, like this side and do it there. But anyways, so we do a vertical split and then we have a split. And then uh, over here, I now have just another window and I can move this around and you can see that it's uh, interactively updating that one at the same time, which is nice. Um, there we go. The other way, by the way, if you want to collapse or split something again, if you move to the very top right-hand corner, this is kind of like the legacy way of doing it, but the, like your cursor changes to like a little target symbol. If you click and drag that way, it splits it and you can do it uh, this way as well. And then if you want to join them, like collapse them, you just do it in the opposite direction. Click and drag that way. Um, so yeah, that's pretty good. Um, the only other thing I'm gonna do as well is like the size of my lamp there. It looks a little bit like, um, sorry, I'm gonna split the view again so that we can actually see the lamp. Uh, it looks a little bit like sunlight, like it looks a little bit too hard of light source. So I'm going to, whoops, not the power, the size of my light right there. You can see the larger I make this, the softer this shadow becomes. If I turn off my overlay, I can focus on a little bit better. Um, you don't wanna go too soft because then it kind of like loses um, emphasis or direction, uh, but just something that's not looking like sunlight, um, something like that. And I'll turn down the power just slightly. Oh, by the way, now that we're talking, uh, you know, about doing a final render, in my like my full lighting series, which if you do get serious about CG, I recommend watching that because I go into a lot of detail about this, but I explain how you can actually find out what the correct light value you should be using because every monitor is actually different and what looks okay to you might look too dark or too bright for somebody else. So if you don't have that thing that's been popping up repeatedly is the spider. I've got this device which will like make my monitor more accurate for color. Um, but if you don't have one of those, because you don't need it, uh, if you switch in the render settings right here, you've got a color man underneath color management You've got a view transform. If you change that to false color, it'll everything will look psychedelic. But these values here will tell you whether something is overly bright or not. And really you want things to be at just above, like just on gray or above gray. So this like top of this icing here is kind of like what my focus is gonna be. So looking at my lamp, I'm just gonna turn that down just a little bit. Like it, it can be a little bit overexposed, this, this green value here can be a little bit overexposed, but not too much. Anyway, that's enough. That's enough for now. And then before I do another render, I'll just, um, because I actually think that uh, blue, blue for the ground, it looks okay. But I actually realized that you can use, uh, if you make it like within this pink pastel color, we did split testing for this tutorial. We put some adverts up on Facebook to test, you know, what thumbnail would actually perform best for this tutorial. And um, yeah, apparently we did like some different ones with like the background here and we, we had ones that were blue and then some that were pink and the pinks outperformed by a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I guess like <laughs> it's up to you, but based on my test, it seems like the aesthetic looks, uh, it, look it looks nicer when you have like just pink on pink. So that's what I'm gonna go with. All right, now before we do a render, I'm gonna give this a save. Let's give this a save right now. I just hit Control Shift S to do that save. And all right. Now, if we hit F12 right now, which is the shortcut for rendering, you'll see these tiles will appear. It'll go one by one by one. And um, yeah, so I do have two tiles because I have two graphics cards and I'm using the GPU. If you have CPU, you might see like eight tiles because it's gonna use the cores of the CPU to do it. Um, but CPUs are often generally slower than graphics cards. But anyways, so uh, the speed at which it's doing this is dependent on the number of samples. So the samples are defined right here. So the viewport is set to 32 by default. So you can see in the viewport here, it's quite noisy because we're rendering at just 32 samples, which is a very, very low sample amount. The final render it's doing at 128, which you can see is far less noisy. But when you zoom right in, you can still see there's quite a lot of noise there. So 
one way to reduce that is to just increase that. But every time, like if you were to double the samples and make it two. 56, right? 256 samples. That would kind of like double the render time. And you can do that, but yeah, you wouldn't ever even really clear up all the noise. There would always be like some noise there. Thankfully, there is something called denoises, which after the render is finished, it can try to intelligently read where the, um, oh, there it is, where the edges are and where some where noise is and try to remove the noise. Um, and 2.8, Blender 2.8, so if you're watching this as I upload it, uh, make sure you get this latest version from the Blender Builder website. Um, yeah, Blender 2.81 has a denoiser in it, which is incredible. It's the uh, Intel AI denoiser. And the way you use it is you go to your uh, layer panel first and you make sure you turn on denoising data. And then when you do that, you have to do another render. So we'll do that quickly. There we go. And then once the render is finished, we're gonna go, and this is, you know, for a beginner tutorial, it's a little advanced, but we're gonna go to the compositor. So this compositor tab along the top there. And this is, uh, yeah, it's everything that's gonna happen to your render after a render is finished. Um, and what you can do in here is you could add in nodes that do things. You could add glow, glare, um, you can do all sorts of things, color grading, everything can happen in here. And uh, yeah, it, it's a little advanced, but just follow me for just this part. And later on in the future levels, we'll talk more about using nodes properly. But just for this, it's really simple to do. Uh, we're gonna hit Shift A, same hotkey as the viewport, and we're going to add in a denoiser node. Um, and uh, since this is so new, I actually just realized I don't even know which menu it's under, but you can do a search. <laughs> you can type in denoise. So with this, all we need to do is take the output of the excuse me, noisy image, put that into the image part, the uh, denoiser, denoising normal, the purple goes in the purple, and then the denoising albedo goes into the albedo. And then we take that and we put that into the composite uh, input right there. Now, when we do that, if we were to hit F11, um, F11, by the way, is the hotkey to bring up the old render, the, the most recent render, nothing has actually changed because uh, when you're doing, I don't know why they changed this in Blender, but it really annoyed me. Like it won't actually affect the final render unless it's viewable as you're using the compositor. You could do another render right now and it would actually kick into gear. But in order, like if I don't wanna have to do another render, I can just go to the image editor down here, uh, set this to render result. And then if I, take this out and put this back in. It will actually refresh it, do the full render. And now uh, control space, by the way, will make maximize any view that your mouse is over. So control space, bring that up. And now as we zoom in, you can see it's cleared up all that noise as if it were magic. And uh, it's really, really powerful, this Intel denoiser. And uh, as far as I know, it will work on even AMD processors, as far as I know. Um, maybe that'll change in the future. <laughs> I don't know when Intel catches on to what the AMD users are up to. But uh, it's really, really super impressive. Blender had a denoiser previously, and it did it quite immediately. Like it was, yeah, it was easier to use, but it was really like, didn't do anywhere near as good a result as this. Um, so yeah. There we go, guys. So that is the end of level one. You Yay! made it. Yay! So uh, thank you for watching. Go ahead and uh, share it with your friends if you found this helpful and help them get into Blender. But I hope you will continue the rest of this series as we add in sprinkles. We'll learn about particles. We'll learn about displacement, making the donut look more like textured bumpy donuts, adding in bumps, uh, as well as texture painting, painting on textures, and then doing precise modeling for the coffee cup, and then final renders and animation as well to the end. So it's a big series and it's designed to give you that full scope of what you're gonna need to know in Blender. So I hope you will join me in the next level. Go ahead and click here if you're ready to uh, start watching now.